Ah, the Monticello Hotel in Longview, Washington, where history meets hoarding. The hundred-year-old hotel is owned by Philip Lovingfoss. Philip's connection to the hotel goes way back to when he was just eight years old and his mother worked there. Fast forward a few decades and he's bartending at the same joint, falling head over heels for the owner, Annabella Jewell, who was, let's just say, a woman of experience, much his senior in terms of age. After Annabella's unfortunate passing, it is Philip who inherited all of Annabella's assets, including the Monticello Hotel. Philip both owns and operates the hotel, along with his girlfriend and general manager, Ginger, who also happens to be 30 years his senior. Ah, uh, love knows no age. Philip really likes older women, it seems. With his multi-million dollar inheritance, both Ginger and Philip have been living the good life. Despite that, though, Philip is underpaying the staff, with one server in particular still making minimum wage after working there for 12 years. Philip and Ginger are oblivious to this fact and actually flaunt their wealth in front of their poorly paid staff. Philip wears rings on his hands with over $100,000 worth of diamonds on it. But still, he can't afford to pay his staff properly. Back to the hotel, though. While Philip and Ginger have been enjoying themselves, the hotel has been struggling. The Monticello only has four suites available for guests. Why? Because the rest of the space is a storage unit for Philip and Ginger's personal belongings. They even have a motel they affectionately call the North Wing, which is basically the hotel's sad little sibling. To make matters worse, Philip has a massive drinking problem. He even gets drunk on shift in front of his staff. Ginger is worried that Philip will drink himself to death. Not only that, but it is revealed that Philip got a DUI for driving under the influence of alcohol the day before the hotel episode was filmed. Unbelievable. This is going to be an episode that will forever live in infamy. As the show goes on, Gordon Ramsay arrives and is immediately struck by the hotel's grandeur. It really is a beautiful old place. Also, the day he arrives, there is a classic car show in the parking lot out front. How cool is that? One of the cars even has a custom Hotel Hell license plate. I guess they knew Chef Ramsay was coming. Well, actually, it's not a car show. All of those fancy cars belong to Philip. Inside, Gordon is greeted by Vanessa, the receptionist. She takes him to his room. However, that room is not in the hotel, but rather in the cheap-looking motel next door. But he's having none of that. He demands a suite in the main hotel, and what he finds is, well, hideous. The decor screams, Philip and Ginger's garage sale, right down to the mattress, which someone can have the privilege of staying on for a mere $250 per night. Vanessa then gives him a tour of the other rooms, which look like scenes from an episode of Hoarders. Meeting the owners, Gordon is flabbergasted that Philip and Ginger are an item. He's even more shocked to learn that the hotel is bleeding money around $30,000 to $35,000 a month. Both owners blame the staff for their woes, but Gordon's about to get a taste of the real problem. All of this must have made Chef Ramsay hungry, so he heads to the restaurant for lunch. Debbie, a 12-year veteran at the hotel, the one who still makes minimum wage, serves Gordon. Chef Dan reveals the kitchen's dirty secrets. Everything is either canned, frozen, or prepackaged. Gordon's taste buds confirm this unfortunate fact. Gordon's first dish is frozen Chilean crab with a snot-like dip. It's like a dish ready for one of Philip's girlfriends. No teeth. Ramsay sends back the food to the kitchen. Ginger blames Dan, the chef. I am very disappointed with Dan's food. It's horrible. Ginger throws Dan under the bus by further insisting the problem with the restaurant is the staff. Back at the table, Debbie says that Philip drinks way too much. She also informs Gordon about Philip's DUI he got the day before. In a meeting with the kitchen staff, Chef Dan laments the lack of fresh ingredients thanks to Philip's decision making. Gordon points out that the skimpy hours given to the kitchen staff are ruining the food quality. Gordon then dives into Philip's drinking problem, which Philip denies faster than you can say cocktail. 
Chef Ramsay then talks to the bartender, Grant, who spills that Philip downs five to eight drinks a day on average. Let's remember Grant as we will return to him later on. After the dinner service, the staff gathers and unanimously agrees. Philip is not the helping hand he claims to be. Debbie voices her concerns about Philip's drinking affecting their work. Gordon then takes everyone to his suite and reveals, via blacklight, the unspeakable horrors on his mattress. The staff, particularly Grant, is emotional, talking about their poor wages and long hours. Gordon is livid at Philip's flashy lifestyle while his staff struggles. That night, Gordon chooses to sleep in the bathtub, a decision influenced by the black light revelations. The next morning, Gordon arranges a feedback session with the guests, who are far from impressed. From cleanliness issues to feeling duped into staying at the motel, the guests make it clear they won't be returning. Ginger finally admits her concerns about Philip's drinking. Gordon stages an intervention, and after some resistance, Philip finally agrees to seek help. Overnight, Gordon's team transforms the hotel. New furniture, new suites, and a fresh menu. Rather than frozen seafood, they now have fresh salmon. Because, you know, this is the Pacific Northwest and all. So, what happened to the Monticello Hotel after the cameras stopped rolling and Gordon Ramsay left the hotel? Chef Dan loves the new menu with a focus on fresh ingredients. Business picked up at the hotel, and it wasn't just a flash in the pan. The new suites were getting booked and the restaurant started to see more foot traffic. The uptick in revenue had a direct impact on the staff. They started receiving better pay, which was a welcome change, especially considering the long hours and hard work they had been putting in. Dan thanks Gordon for saving 50 people's jobs. As for Philip, the man with the diamond accessories and a penchant for the bottle, he took some steps to address his drinking problem. He enrolled in a rehabilitation program, a move that signaled his commitment to not just improving himself, but also the hotel he inherited. Chef Dan, who himself had been sober at that point for nearly a decade, stood by Philip as his sponsor, offering a steady hand and wise counsel. That's such a nice thing to do. So, you thought that the Monticello Hotel's story ended on a high note. Well, the plot thickens. After Gordon Ramsay's visit, the reviews on TripAdvisor were a mixed bag. While some guests appreciate the changes, Others were less than thrilled, particularly about the closure of the restaurant and lounge. It seems the Gordon Ramsay magic dust had a limited shelf life. By September 2016, the Monticello Hotel was in hot water financially. The property was listed for both sale and lease online, signaling that Philip and Ginger's reign was coming to an end. Indeed, by early 2017, Philip was out, and new owners took the helm. They didn't just bring in new staff. They had grand plans for the property. In October 2017, the hotel underwent a multi-million dollar renovation. The restaurant, which had been sorely missed, was slated to reopen. But here is where it gets really interesting. The Monticello Hotel became something of a hot potato, changing hands more than four times since the show aired. And then, in August 2019, the final curtain fell. The Monticello Hotel closed its doors for good, but the building found a second life converted into studio apartments that promote communal living with shared facilities. It's a far cry from its days as a hotel with a tumultuous past, but perhaps that's fitting. After all, the Monticello Hotel was always a place full of stories, and now it has a new chapter. But let's talk about Philip, the man who once wore diamond accessories and owned a fleet of cars. Regrettably, Philip's battle with alcohol didn't end when the hotel hell cameras stopped rolling. His struggles have led to multiple encounters with law enforcement since his time in the spotlight. In 2015, Philip was arrested on charges of DUI and hit and run. But it didn't stop there. While that case was still in the legal pipeline, Philip found himself at odds with the legal system. Specifically, he ran afoul of the Cowlitz County judge presiding over his case. This led to a 90-day jail sentence for intimidating the judge, adding another layer of complexity to his already troubled journey. What happens to Philip after that is a bit of a mystery. There is a rumor circulating online that he passed away, but I couldn't find any evidence to support that, so I think it was just a planted rumor. How about the rest of the staff on the show? What happened to them? Do you remember Grant, the friendly bartender? 
As mentioned earlier, the hotel and restaurant underwent a multi-million dollar renovation. The new owners opened the Long Bell Steakhouse. However, it closed less than nine months after opening. This is where Grant and his wife Sherry swooped in. They decided to open their own restaurant in the space, fittingly called Grant's. And it looks like both Grant and Sherry have done a wonderful job. Yet, this is unfortunately where the story takes a sad turn. On February 19, 2023, at 2.30 in the morning, Grant Hadler was found unconscious not too far from the restaurant. After being admitted to the ICU, he remained there until Sunday. It was on this day that his family faced the heart-wrenching decision to say their final goodbyes. Multiple scans revealed that Grant had sustained irreversible brain damage, leaving no hope for him to regain consciousness. Originally, the cause of death was presumed to be the result of a fall he took. However, following an autopsy, police began investigating the incident as a homicide from an assault. Following the investigation, a 42-year-old man named Ruperto Aguayo of Kelso was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. In the police report, Aguayo claimed he hit Hadler once for allegedly touching his girlfriend inappropriately during a car ride. A witness actually backed up this account. However, Sherry Hadler, Grant's widow, called this a fabricated story, insisting her husband respected women and didn't know anyone in the car except for one acquaintance. Aguayo's defense attorney has filed for a second autopsy, questioning if a single punch could cause Grant Hadler's cardiac arrest. The initial autopsy by Dr. Marta Burt suggested the injuries were consistent with an assault by a blunt object, not a single punch. One of the emergency medical personnel that arrived on the scene reportedly informed authorities that he suspected Grant had been assaulted, citing injuries to his face, nose, and ribs. Aguayo's legal defense team argues that the injuries might be due to medical interventions post-incident. Sherry Hadler's response to the motion for a second autopsy was skeptical, and she said, good luck with that. In a tragic turn of events that leaves more questions than answers, the Hadler family and a community are left grappling with the loss of a man whose life ended amidst a swirl of controversy and unresolved issues. If anyone has more information on this case, such as follow-up information, please share in the comments below. Grant's restaurant continues to operate to this day. He leaves behind a wife and three sons. There is a GoFundMe campaign to raise money for the family. I encourage you to check it out and if possible, donate. Thanks for watching.